All right, this is the third lecture for Unit 5 overview, and we're looking at capacitors. So we'll start off by looking at what capacitors are, how they work, and then we'll look at the details. So capacitors store charge. They have two plates which you get charged which get charged up. Between the plates, to prevent any current flowing between them, there's a dielectric material and that's an insulator. So there is no charge flowing across the dielectric material during normal operation of the capacitor. Uh, in order to make the plates as big as possible, they're rolled up like this. So we've got an electrode in the middle there, and then we have the plates coiled up with, and the dielectric material is sandwiched between them. And there's obviously material between the other the plates on the inside and outside of the coils as well. Those plates, they store charge, and the plates have a specific polarity as well. Um, you use a power supply, a direct current power supply to charge them, and you must always connect the positive terminal of the power supply to the positive plate and negative to the negative. So if we were to correctly set up that capacitor in a circuit, then we'd have this. The positive terminal here of the battery is connect, would be connected to the positive plate of the capacitor when the switch is closed, and negative to the negative. And equal amounts of charge are stored on the plates. So uh, obviously one is storing positive charge and the other one is negative, but the actual magnitude of the charge stored is the same for both of those. Uh, let's now close the switch on this circuit. When we close the switch, the reason that charging happens is the cell forces electrons off of the positive plate and it forces electrons onto the negative plate. Okay? So that's what happens during the charging process. So this is indicating electron flow here. Note that conventional current would be in the opposite direction, so conventional current would be in this direction. But actually what's happening in physical reality is electrons being forced off and off. So by forcing electrons off of here, we're left with positive charge on that plate, and the amount of positive charge would be equal to the amount of negative charge which is forced onto this plate. So we force more electrons onto that one. When the voltage across here, is equal to the voltage of the supply, that's when charging will stop. Okay, and during discharging, the electrons, so when, when we discharge, we open this. Okay, so when this is closed, the power supply is connected across the capacitor, that will charge it. When we, there would also be current flowing through the resistor during that case, because they're in parallel, but when we open this, Charging stops and discharging will start. And the electrons that had accumulated on here will flow through the resistor to the positive plate. Okay, because the, the circuit wants to become neutral again, so the negative charge accumulated here is going to flow around to cancel out that positive charge. So that's what will happen. Conventional current will obviously be in the opposite direction again. So that's what, what the... Uh, what the capacitor does and how it does it. Uh, the capacitor equation, the voltage across the capacitor is directly proportional to the charge that is stored on it. So Q is proportional to V. Uh, the proportionality constant is C, the capacitance. So Q equals CV and so if you want to know what capacitance is, it's charge stored per unit voltage, Q over V. Okay? So capacitance does not tell you how much charge in total can be stored in the capacitor, it tells you how much charge per unit voltage. All right? So it's, uh, that, that for that reason it has a different unit to coulombs. It's not coulombs, it's one farad, it's the farad after Faraday. Um, so it's farad F and one farad is equal to one coulomb per volt. So that's the capacitor equation, we'll refer back to that in a moment as well. Now, the discharging profile 
is not constant, it, capacitors do not discharge at a constant rate. They discharge differently to that. So let's try and understand what's happening, what, what the method or what, what the reason for discharge is. Electrons have accumulated on the negative plate and they repel each other because they're all negatively charged. And there's positive charge on the positive plate because once you've removed electrons off it, you're left behind, you've left behind the positive ions. So there's more positive ions than electrons or a stronger positive charge. Um, now, the, so that positive plate attracts electrons as well. As electrons begin to move off the negative plate, you're going to have fewer and fewer electrons left in order to repel electrons off of the negative plate. So the total negative charge is decreasing there. That repulsive force on the electrons is decreasing. There. And as electrons move onto the positive plate, they're cancelling out that positive charge. So the total positive charge also decreases as time goes on. So the attraction decreases. Here the repulsion decreases, here the attraction decreases. So the rate of discharge decreases with time, and if you analyse it, it actually obeys, it's another exponential decay. So there's an exponential decay with the discharge rate. And the reverse process, charging, is also an exponential decay. So the, here the reverse is true. As you're trying to force electrons onto the negative plate, as you get more and more electrons on there, the total negative charge is increasing, so it's harder to force more electrons on. And on the positive plate, as you're moving electrons off, because the positive charge is increasing, it's harder and harder to move electrons off of it. So both discharging and charging processes are uh, obey an exponential decay. So uh, resistors in the circuit oppose the flow of charge, they, they oppose current. So the actual discharge process is also going to be a function of the resistance. It's going to depend on what the resistance is. So let's look at the, how we arrive at the exponential equation. Current is voltage over resistance, and current is defined as the rate of flow of charge. We've got a negative there because this is discharging, okay, so the, the current is decreasing with time. Now we can substitute for our capacitor equation here for the voltage, so V is Q over C, I've substituted that in there, so we've got Q over RC is equal to minus DQ over DT. If we group the Q terms and then we can integrate with limits, this is quite similar to the derivation of the exponential equation for nuclear uh, for radioactive decay, you may have already seen that. Alright, so I've grouped the terms, I've got minus 1 over RC here, now that's all constant. DT is equal to minus DQ over Q. Okay, so I've brought the Q over there and the minus DT over here. So I've rearranged it and we can integrate that now. <coughs> and we're integrating with limits at time zero. The charge is going to be the initial charge, Q0, and at time t it's Q. Those are my limits. This is all constant, so that's not going to take part in the integration. And we're integrating 1 over Q dQ. The integral of 1 over Q with respect to Q is log Q, natural log Q. So now my integration, once I've integrated, this becomes uh, for we're integrating 1 with respect to t, so that becomes t. With my limits, that's t minus 0. And I'm integrating 1 over q, so that becomes log q. So it's log q minus log q0 with my limits. And then I rearrange all of that. And I get minus t over rc is equal to log q over q0. I've applied a log rule here to find that to one term. Rearrange that. And the way that charge changes with time is according to this exponential decay here. So it's Q0 multiplied by e to the minus t over rc. So you can see now how the exponential decay is a function 
uh, the discharge is a function of the resistance and also a function of the capacitance. Because V is proportional to Q, then we can we, we substitute for using Q equals CV and we get V equals V0 e to the minus T over RC. Uh, essentially replacing Q with V there. So that's useful because now we know how the voltage, which is a much more useful quantity compared to charge for capacitor circuits, we can see how that changes with time. And you can also do the same with current as well, so you can have I and I0. Let's look at the graph then. Um, because it's an exponential decay at base and uh, a constant ratio property, and the constant ratio property, unlike radioactive decay, is based upon 37%. So radioactive decay is based on 50%. We talk about half-life there. Uh, it's more convenient to talk about 37% because e to the minus 1 is equal to 0.37, so two significant figures. Okay? What, what we're doing there is when the time is equal to the value of Rc, you get e to the minus 1. So that's 0.37 multiplied by V0. So uh, that, that would be that time that corresponds to that would be the time at which V is 37% of V0, or 37% of current if you're dealing with current and so on. That time is called the time constant, and that's equal to RC. Uh, that symbol is the Greek letter tau, so T-A-U, if you want to spell it. Uh, right, now we can plot our graph then. So we're plotting voltage against time here, but the profiles will be the same if you're dealing with charge or current. You start with V0, and after one time constant, tau, we're down to 0.37 V0. And at the second time constant, it's decayed by the same ratio, because you've got this constant ratio, so we're now at 37% of 37% of V0. So that is 0.14 V0, or 14%. So that's um, to 2SF as well. Okay. So after one time constant, we're down to 37%. After the second one, we're down to 14%. And then so on, it goes on. So that's uh, the equation. Now, and the graph, let's look at the factors. The factors of discharge are resistance and capacitance. So if we take our circuit here, I'm discharging my capacitor through this resistor here. So capacitance C, resistance R. And now let's double my resistance by putting a second R in series with R there. So now I've got a total resistance of 2R. I've increased R, what would the graph now look like? Well, now the time constant is longer than for the initial situation because tor equals RC, so it's directly proportional to the resistance if I keep the, comp the capacitance the same. So it take longer. Uh, all I'm saying here is that I've increased the time constant. I'm not actually saying it's necessarily using 2R exactly, so if it's 2R, time constant would be twice as long. Right, so that's how the graph would change in broad strokes. What about if you have series and parallel combinations of capacitors, just like uh, with resistors? It's, in, it's useful to know how resistance changes with series and parallel combinations. So we're going to do the same with capacitors. What I'm going to do is find out which, what, what one capacitance would be the equivalent of two that are in series. So I've got two capacitors, C1 and C2, and then I have uh, CS, meaning the single capacitor that would be equivalent to those two in series. So that's why it's subscript S. Now the same charge is going to flow to those capacitors being stored and the voltage across them is shared. In, in series, you always have a shared voltage. 
Um, the same current is flowing around that circuit loop, and that's why, in series, the same charge is flowing to them. So, uh, now we can see that the, volt, the total voltage across here is equal to the, that voltage, V1 plus V2, and that the total voltage is the same in both cases, so Vs is V1 plus V2. Now we can substitute for those voltages using the capacitor equation, which is V is Q over C. So we've got, because it's the same charge flowing to all the capacitors, it's Q over Cs for this voltage, Q over C1 for this one, Q over C2 for this one. And you can see that we can divide out those Qs because we've got Qs in each term. Divide those out, we get 1 over Cs is equal to 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2. So, if we put capacitors in series, the total capacitance will decrease according to this equation. And don't forget, when you do calculations with these reciprocals, just like when you were doing parallel resistors, you need to take into account that you've got to take the reciprocal after working out this bit. Okay? Um, the difference with these is that this is series, and we get the reciprocal equation, whereas with resistors, in series it was adding up and in parallel it was decreasing. What about in parallel? Here's my C1 and C2 here and this is my total one capacitor that will be equivalent to the parallel combination. The charge stored on each one is going to be different. It's going to be the total charge flowing in there is going to be shared and the same voltages across each of them. So uh, total voltage across here is the same across C1 and C2. So the total charge flowing is equal to the sum of the charges flowing into each one. So that QP is equal to Q1 plus Q2. That's the charge stored there is the sum of those two. And then we can replace for Q equals CV here. So CP multiplied by V is equal to, so that's equal to QP. C1V1, C1V, sorry, and C2V there. We've got a voltage term, a V term in each of those separate terms there, so we can divide by V, both sides of the equation, we get the total capacitance is a sum of the individual capacitances. So here, the total capacitance increased, and you can see that that's the reverse of what happened with resistors. So those are series and parallel combinations. What do we use capacitors for? Well, well, in terms of the actual practical functionality, we're storing energy in them. So we use capacitors to store energy. We use that, so that makes them similar to a cell. Cells store energy as well, batteries, they store energy. But they work differently because whereas with a battery you get roughly constant current over a period of time, with the capacitors, you get that dis you get that exponential discharge. So the current decreases with time, according to an exponential decay. And um, also, you know, because there's no actual charge, there's no current flow between the plates across the dielectric. There's no internal resistance here. So cells they have internal resistance. Capacitors don't. So that's a bit of an advantage for them. If we want to find out how much energy is stored by a capacitor, we do it by looking at the QV graph. Um, if you remember the equation from AS physics, voltage is work done per unit charge, so therefore the product of charge and voltage gives you the energy stored. Now, if you actually plot the voltage charge graph, you get a straight line. So we're not doing a straight product here, what we actually need to look at is the area under the curve. So if we look at the area under the curve, we get a triangle, uh, that's the energy stored, and I will say more about why it's not just straight product in a moment. Uh, so the, the energy stored is a half QV. If we substitute using Q equals CV, because you're often not going to know how much charge was stored on the capacitor. So it's much easier if you just can work in terms of the capacitance and the voltage, because voltage is easy to measure. 
So uh, you, to measure directly, that is. Uh, so W equals half CV squared, and that would tell you the energy stored in the capacitor. Why is the energy not this square area here? What, what about this bit here? Well, this was the work done storing the charge. It requires work to force the charge into the capacitor, so therefore there was, there's work done, and that's where this energy went. So what you can get out of it is the remainder here, and that's why it's not the square area. Okay, some uses of capacitors to finish up with. Uh, if you charge up a capacitor, you can get a fast release of energy. So applications that require a high rate of energy dissipation will often use capacitors. Camera flash is one such example. Um, in a camera flash, there's a, gonna, there'll be an array of capacitors. The battery is used to charge up those, those capacitors and then that en the energy that's stored in the capacitor is rapidly discharged across the flash bulb and that huge release of energy in a very short space of time gives you a bright flash. And that's why it's not so much a problem now, but um, older digital cameras with worse battery technology, they would often have a little light that would flash in between taking photographs with the flash to indicate that it was charging and what it was doing is charging up the capacitors ready for the next go and then um, if the battery was had been had not been charged for a long time then uh, it would take longer and longer to charge those capacitors up you can do an experiment as well where you charge up a very high voltage capacitor and a high capacitance capacitor so it's storing a lot of energy and then you discharge it across a thin wire and that wire will be obliterated because it's such a huge amount of energy. Uh, that's quite a common experiment and you can find videos about that out on YouTube. Um, and you'll note there's a very important safety precaution and that is to discharge the capacitor after you've done that experiment because that wire, only a fraction of the energy that was stored in the capacitor was actually discharged and caused the wire to be obliterated to be vaporized so you have to there's still a lot of energy in the capacitor that needs to be discharged afterwards okay and then we have nuclear fusion and um, there's some experiments use very high voltages to charge up capacitors which are then used to power very high powered lasers and uh, you get extreme high energy output and that energy is used to bombard hydrogen fuel giving it enough energy to fuse. So nuclear fusion, and I believe National Ambition Facility is using that method. Then another method, which is not to do with necessarily a fast release of energy, but it is based on the way that capacitors work. Computer power supply backups. When you're normally using a computer that has this type of backup, during normal operation of the computer, by virtue of it being turned on and current flowing in the circuitry, some of the current is going to flow across capacitors to charge them. So that's just during normal operation. Now, should the computer face a sudden power outage, then those capacitors immediately discharge around the circuitry, giving the computer enough time, enough, yeah, enough time to save critical data so that yeah, you've got that backup for when power is restored. So that's useful because capacitors immediately discharge once they've been charged and the power supply is taken off them. Then this, this uses that principle to give you a backup. So that is the third lecture, that's capacitors. And hopefully I'll be back to do medical physics very soon. <laughs>